Good evening, everyone. Why don't we get started? Uh, welcome to the Marin Energy Authority Board Meeting for Thursday, October 4th, 2012. Uh, we've had one request by Director Green to move up the uh, privacy policy item, item 7. Um, and let's put that right after the consent calendar. Don, if that sounds OK. Uh, my understanding is you have to leave. I do. I've got to be in court in Crescent City at 10.30 tomorrow morning. So it's going to be an ugly night. Mm -hmm. Crescent City. Yeah. It's almost all the way to Oregon. <laughs> so any objection to moving item 7 up to after item 4? Seeing that, we'll go ahead and do that. OK, let's start with board announcements. Do we have any this evening? It doesn't look like it. Moving to item two, public open time. A uh, chance for anyone in the public to speak on any items that are not on the agenda this evening. All right, you guys, we're going to expect a little more energy later then. Um, item three, report from executive officer Don. Great, I have a few items this evening. Um, but, but before I get started, I just wanted to announce that we have Jay Marshall here. He's with Prime River Technology and provides all of our IT support uh, for MEA. And he is here because we have done the transition into an electronic format for our board meetings. And um, we just want to make sure if there are any glitches, if any of our board members or staff are having trouble, um, he's standing up here <coughs> and uh, is available if anyone needs some help. Great, welcome. Okay. Um, so the first announcement is I'm, I'm really pleased to, to be able to announce that on October 2nd, uh, Marin, Marin Energy Authority received a letter from the CQC certifying our revised implementation plan, which uh, adds the city of Richmond to the Marin Clean Energy Service Territory, and also means we can now add a new seat to our board. So we're very, very fortunate tonight that we have, um, we're able to offer a warm welcome to Mayor Gail McLaughlin from the city of Richmond, who will be serving as the alternate on our board as a representative of Richmond. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. We're very excited. Richmond's very excited to be a part of this. And I'm, um, of course, the alternate Tom Butt will be, Councilmember Tom Butt will be the regular. He was out of town um, today. So I was very delighted to be able to um, step in and, and just let you know how, how glad we are to be a part of this. This venture. Great, thank you. And we have a couple of other welcomes this evening. The next one is a welcome to our new, the newest addition to our team, Becky Minton. Becky, can you stand up so we can say hello? Becky is, has been hired to serve in our energy efficiency coordinator role. And she comes to us from the California Energy Commission, where she was a program manager and financing lead for the existing building program AB 758. Uh, and contract manager for the Local Government um, Commission Energy Upgrade California project, which we've talked about here quite a bit. Um, prior to her work with the CEC, she worked with the CPC as a research fellow and with the city of Arcata as an energy program specialist running the Energy efficiency Program. So we're very fortunate to have Becky joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and then the third welcome we have this evening is our um, also new, very new addition, Alex Sergio. Alex, can you stand up, please? Um, Alex is a Climate Corps member uh, with legal training, I might add, um, who comes to us to help with outreach both in the, the Marine community but also in the Richmond community. And he's going to be sitting um, at a desk part-time in Richmond, and the city office is there, and part-time is uh, sitting at a desk here upstairs with all of us. Uh, we'll be, has already begun in developing an extensive list of places we're going to be uh, outreaching to in Richmond and um, getting started on that effort. So we're really grateful to have Alex with us for the next year. Um, and then the next item I wanted to, um, uh, oh, one other welcome. I wanted to welcome some representatives that traveled all the way up here from the city of Lancaster, California, um, to join us for the meeting tonight. Um, hello. Um, we have Robert Neal and a few other of his colleagues that came up and they met with the city of San Francisco today to learn about their CCA program. Um, they wanted to see how our uh, board meetings operate and then we'll be, we'll be meeting tomorrow. So we really appreciate you all taking the time to come up here and uh, be part of the meeting. 
By the way, usually half our board is not <laughs> <laughs> so. Where are those guys? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently okay. there's a big yeah, so. <laughs> Great, and then moving into logistics, I um, just wanted to announce that we have a, a technical committee meeting this coming Monday, October 8th, and we're going to be covering two items that are worth mentioning. We encourage the public to attend if there's interest. Also, board members, even if you're not on TechCon, are always welcome to attend. We're we'll talking about the integrated resource plan, which was discussed at our retreat on September 10th. We'll be following up um, with some further discussion on that. We'll also be talking about our feed-in tariff and some possible um, upgrades and improvements that we'll be making to that program. So that will be occurring at uh, 9 a.m. on Monday uh, in the Laurel Room, just across the way there. Um, the next thing I wanted to report on is um, that we have a uh, we had a presentation in El Cerrito this week uh, to their city council. They are interested in exploring the possibility of CCA and um, the the uh, this in initial meeting. Um, seem to be of, of interest and, and I expect we may have further discussions at some point going forward. Um, one other item as far as logistics uh, will be circling out to you regarding the January meeting, which um, at this time falls on January 3rd. We're not sure if we're going to have um, enough folks participating to hold that meeting, so we're looking at um, the possibility of either canceling the meeting or putting it to another day. Um, Darlene or Sarah will be reaching out to you all on that in the next month or so, but just wanted you all to be thinking about it. And the last item that I have um, just is very exciting, and although many of you have probably heard, I wanted to make sure that um, everyone heard that Assembly Bill 976 was vetoed by the governor. And that speaks to many of the efforts of people in this room working with the governor, with the governor's office, to let them know uh, about uh, the many concerns about this bill. And I, I'd like to read a few words from um, his, uh, what he had to say about the bill. He felt that the bill prohibits any company from doing business with the Community Choice Aggregation Program, um, and it goes too far. Adding the restriction in this bill would serve only to impede efforts to establish Community Choice Energy Program. So it's exciting to see that he understands the value of our program and was able to uh, prevent this bill from going into effect. And that's it for my report. Great, thanks Don. Any questions for Don? Members of the public, okay. Great. Um, so item four is our consent calendar. Hopefully everyone had a chance to review that. Any questions, comments? I'll entertain a motion. I'll move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That matter carries. As previously indicated, let's move up item seven, update to your MEA customer privacy pol policy and related. I will be speaking on this matter. Um, this privacy policy is the result of a decision that came from the CPUC um, in 12.08.045, and it's essentially extending the privacy protection requirements that are being imposed upon the investor-owned utilities onto community choice aggregators and gas utilities as well. Um, while we, for jurisdictional concerns, have proposed the language in this decision that ultimately came into effect. So now we're going through the steps of complying with the decision. Um, it's essentially that the modifi modifications, well, I'll guide you through the, the three attachments we have. The first one, attachment B, is the attachment that accompanied the decision issued by the, the commission. It goes through the full detail of all the different steps that we need to take to comply. The primary components are that we have to draft a, a notice explaining how we're going to handle and protect customer uh, usage data and information. Um, that notice will be on our website. We will also have all of our email communications will have a link to that page. Any new customer in the joint of service will be provided a notice pointing them to where they can find the policy. It's fairly standard practice. And then every year we will have to issue a, a notice reminding them of the, or a message reminding them of the notice and where they can find it and of any changes that may have occurred. Um, as far as the actual steps that we have to take to implement this into our internal documents, uh, we have to bring it into our, our implementation plan. We're having to revise our implementation plan again, unfortunately, right as the commission approved it. So the only real edits are a couple, a few sentences within chapter nine 
customer rights and responsibilities. And it's uh, just very minimal language stating that we will provide the, that we will be in compliance with the, the requirements within the, the decision. And providing a little bit of language to state about when these notices need to occur and what customers should expect. Uh, we're essentially going to follow the the um, steps that the utilities are undergoing themselves to, to mimic the structure of how this notice needs to be set up and the exact um, phrasing, but it's pretty much we're looking to the board to approve uh, this item and to go ahead and to tell us to go forth and implement the required steps that we need to do to comply. Question. So this is the standard language um, that's uh, put forward by the CPs. <coughs> yeah. Right. And if I could add a couple of things, this item was discussed in the executive committee um, with many of your board members, and um, and as as we discussed there, the, the main changes will be adding some language to our standard emails that go out, our website uh, related to our customer privacy policy, um, and, and as Jeremy mentioned, making a few um, additions in the implementation plan that will just point to the commission's decision saying that we will comply with the decision. Questions? Mm -hmm. Director Green. Can, can you explain how the mechanics work in terms of consumer privacy, um, is it sort of the standard modern form where the default is less privacy unless the consumer uh, executes some sort of notice where he or she says, I want more or I don't consent to the sharing of my information? Uh, is, is that what the overall structure is of this? So it's, it's well protected uh, to begin with though. There's very strict definitions of the types of third parties, the primary and secondary third parties that we can contract with and pr provide this information to them. And there's a very distinct set of, of roles that these third parties can fulfill. So an example of the sorts of third parties that would have access to this protected information would be our associates, John and Kirby. Sure. Um, so it would be a very limited pool of, of third party individuals managing the data. There are options for customers to um, either, they can request to see their information, to vet it, to make sure that, that it's accurate. They can uh, go through the steps to revise any of the information that's there. And I believe there are requirements there are allowances for them to, to restrict, further restrict the access. And if I might add further I, I, to that. Just in, I, I just, when you say you believe, are you sure? I look right here. Yeah, and I think part of what you're asking is, um, what is what is standard practice for handling customer information? And it's um, what, this is really just bolstering the protections that already exist but expanding them so that they apply to electronic data or smart meter data. Um, the, the protections that exist are um, very comprehensive and there are very, um, very uh, strong restrictions against sharing any customer, confidential customer information. Um, we have to, any, any of our vendors or employees that have access to data have to sign an NDA um, to, and, and have to be aware of what the policy is regarding not disclosing that sort of information. There are very strict guidelines with regards to what type of customer information we can give out. Um, typically, we have to adhere to um, requirements around um, aggregate. We can give out aggregate data um, if we're not um, providing anything that could be identified to. It, no, I, under, I understand yeah. that, but it's still, I'm not, I'm, I'm not yet, I don't think my question is really answered. I'm not asking whether or not there are comprehensive protections. I'm asking about what the extent of consumer choice is and whether the default going in means that there's less consumer protection and in terms of what the disclosure of, of private information is and if the consumer wants more protection, that's not the default. He or she has got to affirmatively ask for it. That, that's really what the gist of my question is. 
one. And if that is the case, then my follow-up question is, do we have any choice? Do we have any choice to reverse the default so that going in, there's more protection ipso facto to the consumer, and if he or she or it wants less, then they consent to it. They don't have to exercise themselves to protect what I think ought to be more protected to begin with. That's the, the gist of what I'm asking about, not uh, the overall comprehensiveness of protection, it's just what's the structure and how does it work? <clears throat> so this is an increase in the level of protection, not a decrease. If that's okay. Um, well, in other words, I think Director Green is asking, do you have to affirmatively opt up to do, the, do you, well, like, in, well, like in other words, with, when you're with a bank, when you're with a bank or your insurance company, all of that stuff, credit card, yeah. that sort of thing. I, this seems like more just a set now higher level. Yeah, it's right? across yeah. the board. It, it doesn't yeah. relate to individuals asking for a higher level of, uh, of confidential uh, protection. Um, it is a requirement that uh, all um, all vendors that have access to this information or load serving entities that have access to it. Um, protected at a higher level. Can I jump in here a second? I mean, I, as I'm reading the text of this, there's procedures provided to customers for granting and revoking authorization for secondary uses of covered information. But that there doesn't seem to be that process for primary uses of information. Although there's certain protections so that there isn't disclosure of customer information. It, even with respect to the primary purposes of information. Right, so the primary purposes would be to calculate usage, for example, to track mm -hmm. the customer's usage and bill the customer. So that would be for the energy provider themselves. Right. Yeah. The secondary uses would be a vendor, like someone that wanted to provide energy efficiency services, for example, would be considered secondary. Well, one of the things that, that it, it talks about in terms of uh, the data that's available for a customer's own scrutiny is equal to that that is provided to third parties. Uh, and isn't that a, a different level uh, than what the data is that's available to the utility for, like, for billing purposes or for, for billing according to time of usage and whether or not uh, there are going to be increased rates for hot times of usage and, and that sort of thing? Uh, is that level of detail that the utility gets from the customer, is, is that same level of detail available to the customer, him or herself? Yes. It is. So, so the customer is on an equal footing in terms of his or her own information as the, as the information harvester, as, as the utility is. So they're on, on a par, they're, they're equal. <clears throat> okay. Good question. Any uh, further thoughts, director? Questions? Questions. To, to what extent are we at risk with this higher standard? We, in terms of blowing a kid on this one, where we uh, we we don't keep confidential that which we should, and do we have insurance coverage to the extent that we have additional risk? Yeah, no, that's a great question. This really. Um, bolsters the practices that we already have in place to protect customer com confidentiality. Our main concern <coughs> about the imposition of this regulation is really the jurisdictional issue, where the CPC often forgets that they don't really have jurisdiction over CCAs. And so when um, these types of decisions occur, you know, we do what we can to um, make it clear that we have our own governing board that sets policy and is the public body that oversees our activity. Um, so the jurisdictional issue can bleed over into a lot of different realms, and that was where we, we took issue with this um, uh, this regulation. But um, the actual impact of it on the agency, um, we don't have concerns around risk. We actually think that there is um, there's some positive things about um, saying more about how we protect data. But we already have a policy in place to protect data, and we already are following that policy. So we don't see a real change beyond simply adding some of the specific language that, that's being required by the commission. 
We're insured. We're insured as well. Yes, we do have um, general liability insurance that would cover that sort of thing. There, there are also, you know, as you get into, if, if you want to look closely at this decision, you'll see that there are certain reporting requirements whereby, you know, if a breach is, is made during a year, you are required to report the number of breaches you had um, and what you've done to rectify those breaches. So, um, and, and, and those breaches happen with all utilities and, and there's a process that's followed. I don't know if Jeremy wants to add to that. But, um, We'd be reporting to the, to Ed Randolph, the head of the energy division within the CPUC and working in, in tandem with him to, and his staff to get through and to is, is that the provision that requires you to give notice to the CPC within two weeks of, of finding out uh, that there has been a breach? Yes. Yeah. There's, and then there's, I believe, also an annual follow-up report that summarizes that all the breaches. Uh, so it's that additional level of having to report up to the commission is something that we're not accustomed to. I, I, th I think I'm good. I, I have, I'm not sure that I actually got the answer to my question. Uh, so let me just ask it another way. So when we're dealing here with uh, our ratepayers, the CCA statute opts all of them in. So it defaults their choice to be involved with us and, and, and in order for them not to be involved with us they have to affirmatively opt out and so really the gist of my question is using that as a, a template it's the same in terms of, of privacy is is the way that this the cpuc decision sets up the use of private information is the default mean that the information's available to be used first and any restrictions as, that are available as to the use of that information can only be imposed if the consumer, if the ratepayer affirmatively says, no, I don't want you to use my information. Is, is that how it's set up? Yes. Okay. Yes. With the, and it's with the secondary usage that the that opt out is the right, not with the, the primary, primary. With the primary, the choice is pretty much removed. Yes. <laughs> okay. And then, then, so my follow up question is do we have any choice in terms of our compliance or, or modification of that structure, or are we simply stuck with it? We are definitely stuck with it. Okay, that answers my question. Thanks. Yeah. Any further <laughs> questions? Members of the public, any discussion on this item? Okay, why don't we bring it back? <clears throat> so, I believe we need a motion, right, Jeremy? For yes. approval. Do I have a motion? I'll move approval. <laughs> <laughs> Second. 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 We got a motion and second. All in favor? Uh, yes. Yeah. Opposed? <laughs> that matter carries. Okay, returning to item five amendments to fiscal year 012 13 budget to incorporate energy efficiency funding and adjust other budget categories. Great. Um, so I'm going to say a few words and then turn it over to John Maher, who's with, our, with Maher Accountancy. Um, to provide detail and answer any questions you may have. But um, this is the first uh, proposed uh, budget am amendment or adjustment um, of this fiscal year, which um, started in April of this year. And the adjustment is really f for two m main purposes. Uh, first, we have received an allocation from the CQC for energy efficiency dollars, and we needed to create a line item for that. And the second uh, item is shifting mm -hmm. revenue into our communications line item, uh, primarily because of the added um, uh, focus on outreach in Richmond, the city of Richmond, um, and some additional outreach and communications that we'll be doing um, in Marin uh, over the, the coming months. Uh, we were able to uh, shift funds that were underspent in a couple of other categories, uh, including legal. So um, do you want to add anything to that, John? I'll, I'll put a couple things in. 
Uh, so you'll notice that the uh, that the amendment net is uh, a no change. So we've, we've got the the um, public purpose energy efficiency program off, directly offset, and then to cover the additional ex expenditures for um, uh, for the communications and a little bit for data manager and a couple other things, uh, we move money that looks like it's going to be in excess uh, in other areas. So there's no net increase here. The, um, uh, Don mentioned about the uh, communications, which is the largest adjustment. The data manager um, was a, t a little bit of a timing difference. Our agreement with the data manager is based on the volume of usage and the number of, uh, of uh, building units, and that scaled in a little differently than was originally estimated. So that's just a small adjustment. Um, and uh, there were, um, uh, it looked like we were running a little close on professional services, um, so we thought we'd better get authorization for just a little bit more room there uh, to carry us through to the end of the year. So there's nothing really, uh, other than those two items, there's really nothing dramatic uh, to change. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions? I have a question that's not directly related, but the, um, the fund balance of two million four ninety um, is that money just held in reserve? Well, well, essentially, yeah, and that actually is not the fund balance per se, but that's the that was the plan <coughs> that was the plan uh, increase. And as you recall, we had this. Well, you were in the midst of, it, of course, of this massive uh, influx of, of of volume. So, uh, in the in the model, there was a little bit of cushion in there to manage expectations and. and to see that reality and the, uh, if reality didn't reflect the plan as far as on the good side, on the income side, that there'd be a little bit of room there. So in, in reality, um, there's another report that you uh, approved, the budget actual, and uh, in, in reality, that, that first uh, five month period performed a little bit less uh, attractively. So you had, uh, rather than the increase of 2.49, we had an increase of 1.5. 1.5 uh, increase, and what does that bring the balance up to? Because the remaining balance of 1.5. Yeah, there was, and I, actually, I didn't bring. Um, uh, I don't think I brought that report with me. I'm for a moment. I did. Let's see. Yeah, I'm sorry to say I didn't. I didn't bring that information with me. Was I presented? It's going up by 1.5, and then we, we hope it will be 249. That would be that. That'd be the hope. Yeah, and and of course, there's you know the the budget was based on projections that were done early early in the year. Volume never turns out to be exactly as you plan in order to rate. So there's a little bit of uh, trying to figure out what you're going to do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Question. Yes. On the budget on other services where there's a little change. I mean, can we just have a little detail of what's included within that budget item? I see it's gone up thirty-five thousand, but. Right. Just generally, what kinds of things are covered under? Other there's, there's going to be uh, miscellaneous professional services. If there's some uh, PR, <coughs> computer consulting, uh, uh, um, some of the, the data management consulting people that are helping out. So it's a, it's kind of a hodgepodge with a bunch of different uh, uh, vendors. I could. Um, you can give some recent examples. We. Um had some work done on the website. We have a, a web form that customers can use to opt out, and that's needed some enhancements over the last few months. We also um, have uh, recently entered into a contract for um, some su legislative support uh, that uh, helped with the uh, AB 976. So those are some examples. I'm just wondering, just, I, I know that we want to try to keep the presentation for the board it's simple. I don't know if it's helpful to footnote it or or if people want more detail how we can do that to facilitate it. I just don't, my concern only is just when you have a kind of a general category like what we just described as hodgepodge. It's that, a big, see, that makes me nervous as a board member. I just uh, kind of want to know what's hodgepodge. Okay, well I can, I'd be happy to share with you the, the details. Yeah, well I'm, I'm saying I don't want to take everyone's time up now. I'm just <coughs> suggesting either it, it comes in a report or there's some sort of footnote just so, so that we can have and I'm not, I don't need it down to the penny, but just general categories of things that are within that. That's what I'm looking for. The, for, the, you know, for the most part, it's professional services other than attorneys. So there's a lot of different professionals. Uh, 
there, you know, as we mentioned. But uh, you want, you'd like to have a list uh, next time, uh, which we can do. That's that's fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I mean, or, or if there's, if we don't want to complicate up the, you know, the the sheet here, you know, so if someone on the board wants the information readily, it's it's, sort of, it's provided. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Makes sense. Any further comments? Yes. Um, I know I had a um, phone conversation with John and Alex and someone else was on the phone, I couldn't remember, but um, that explained a lot of this to me and that was very helpful. But would you um, kind of remind me of, so this 400000 that you're adding on the communication consultants and related expenses, that's due to partially, I would say, I'm thinking because of Richmond being added, right? And that is in, but it's also in regard to just ongoing communications in general. There will be continued ongoing communications in general, um, although if we were not expanding into Richmond and doing the enrollment next year, um, we would not have needed this, the adjustment here. Okay. And um, everything from mailings to, um, you know, all, some of the stuff, out, all of the stuff are, that Alex will be working on fits into that. Right, right. including staffing, um, so, um, but, uh, well, staffing, there will be some staffing support, but um, the marketing that we do in that area, um, we, um, we will do some advertisements in local media, we'll do a lot of outreach uh, to local groups and community organizations, um, and distribute literature, produce literature, distribute literature. Um, the opt-out notices that we send actually add up to quite a bit, because we, we need to send um, quite a few of them um, to many customers, so um, that's an expense in and of itself. Um, so those are some examples. So that's like this first getting another city on board as uh, kind of a one-time thing. And the other question is, you mentioned this, and I forgot what the fiscal year was different. It seemed then. The fiscal the year, year is always April one to March thirty one. Okay, starts on March thirty one. Okay, so this is just there'll be another budget coming forward right around the end of March. Yeah, typically we begin our budget planning in January, and February, and we finalize the uh, next year's fiscal budget in early March, and then it goes into effect. We also do our rate setting along the same time frame so that we can um, keep the two aligned. Thank you. Any further board discussion? <coughs> uh, members of the public on this side? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back. Uh, looks like we need a motion. I'll move. Second. All in favor? Uh, uh, yes. <coughs> opposed, that matter. Okay, moving to item six, uh, resolution of the board, approving the renewal of, renewal of revolving line of credit with River City Bank in the principal amount not to exceed one million dollars. Great. Done. Yeah, so this item is really just a renewal of a line of credit, a revolving line of credit that we've had in place with River City Bank um, over the last year. We um, had a line of credit in place with them, but actually did not need to draw on it. Uh, during the last year, um, but it expired at the end of September, and so um, we talked to them about uh, whether or not we, we needed to renew it. Um, we, as we were having these discussions and kind of looking at whether or not to renew it, we noticed, we felt that the amount of the line of credit uh, at this point in time, when our, our budget has grown uh, to over 50 um, a year, it, it the, having a, a line of credit at 500000 didn't seem to be um, really that useful, and so we, we doubled the amount to a million, um, and um, we, would be, um, we would be getting this line of credit in place. And also, the other change that we're proposing to make here is aligning it with the end of our fiscal year um, to conform to <coughs> some legal requirements that, that require that any funds that are borrowed during a fiscal year need to be paid back with funds brought in by the agency <coughs> during that fiscal year. So the um, the end date of this contract is three months after our fiscal year, but the start date would be, um, you know, be after the approval of your board. Um, we don't, one other thing I should say is we don't know that it will be necessary for us to draw on this line of credit, um, but it will be helpful for us to have it um, over the, the next six, six to nine months um, as as we um, uh, complete the uh, 
the the um, the shift um, that we just that we've just um, gone through with adding a, a new batch of customers, and then also prepared to go through the shift with Richmond. Um, so it helps to have that extra liquidity in case it's. Okay. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Yes, Director. Um, what's the the um, the uh, rate of interest on this line of credit refers to a bank commercial lending rate. I'm not familiar with that index. What is that? Yeah, let's see. It's a a variable interest rate. Um, Where is it? Plus one point two five percent. So I think it's a published rate, and I'm I'm sorry I don't have that information here, but I'd be happy to get that for you. No, I'm saying I see that that's the rate. It's one and a quarter on top of that, but I mean it's Obviously, I'm happy it's not LIBOR since we seem to have a few issues with <laughs> with that index. But I just I don't know. We can deduce it's, it's two percent. Right? <laughs> it's currently three point two five. Well, well I understand we can deduce it's two percent. Damon's math is really better than mine. I, I I understand that. I'm just curious if it's mm -hmm. private index rate for River City Bank. Is it what is? It? I've just never heard of it. Yeah. And the reason why I'm asking is. Just how volatile is it? You know, how often does it move? What's what's the deal with it? Because I would hate for us. I know we have a really low interest rate environment, so it's probably not a, a time that we really have to worry about it that much. But mm -hmm. I just would like to know where that in, where that index came from. Yeah, I'm happy to get back to you on that. And I can say that since we've used this in our other agreements with the with the bank, um, we have found it to be very stable. But I'll get back to you with that information. Thank you. How's the overall relationship with River City at this point? Uh, it's very positive. We actually went and gave a presentation at a, a breakfast event they were holding last week in Sacramento. They wanted to have a David and Goliath talk. So uh, we came out and did that, and, and they just uh, sent us a thank you fruit basket today <laughs> for that presentation. So the relationship is great, and uh, they're, they're very excited about having our business. Any other questions or comments on this item? Again, turning to the public, seeing none. This is uh, 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 Barbara. Okay. I, I just have to Welcome. say, <laughs> I was in Davis last week and I saw a branch of River City Bank and I just walked in and said, thank you for the loan for MEA and they were so thrilled. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> nice, good story, yeah. <laughs> Okay, on that note, do I have a motion? I'll move to adopt the resolution. And I'll second it. All in favor? Uh -huh. Yes. Aye. Opposed? That matter carries. Okay, item eight, probably the main item we're going to be addressing this evening. Uh, the third amendment to and restatement of confirmation agreement with Shell Energy North America, second confirmation agreement. Uh, with Shell Energy North America and the First Amendment and Restatement of Confirmation of the Resource Adequacy Requirement with Shell Energy North America. We've uh, been negotiating and have uh, completed a draft set of agreements uh, which reflects changes to the current power supply transaction with Shell Energy North America, uh, CENA for short. And the changes are um, essentially to adjust the contract volumes for consistency with MBA's current load projections. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the crux of this is really the expansion to the city of Richmond scheduled for mid next year. Uh, so, through these, uh, so through these contract adjustments, we're incorporating the, the load necessary to, or the supply necessary to serve those customers. Uh, that's the expansion is going to be uh, our estimate is about 30,000 customers and energy requirements of, of about 400 uh, gigawatt hours annually or 400,000 megawatt hours annually. Um, we've also though, you know, one of the advantages of the way that MEA has structured its program and the phase rollout is we also have an opportunity here as we go to supply the next phase to make adjustments to the existing customer base. And so we've just recently completed the successful enrollment of the phase 2B customers, the, the big enrollment, um, which happened uh, in, in July of this year. And so now we have the actual customer base rather than having to make a, 
uh, projections of what the participation rate is, we can now adjust for the actual participation rate. And so we've taken that opportunity here in, in, in adjusting the contract volumes um, to reflect the, the actual rate for those uh, for that customer base. And then we also um, have been rather busy in procuring energy outside of Shell. And uh, you know the focus has been on renewable energy, uh, contracting for new renewable energy projects. We actually have eight um, different projects under contract. And so uh, we've made adjustments. We've reduced the amount of energy per being purchased from Shell uh, to you know, align essentially with the expected production from these renewable resources that NDA is, is contracting with independently. So on net, you know, we're adding the 400,000, the 400 gigawatt hours of load for Richmond, but then we're taking a lot of that back through self-supply. Um, and so the actual uh, additional energy being procured from Shell is, is less than half of that amount. Um, so it's, it's a variety of, of, of factors that are playing into this, this, this adjustment. The, um, Let me just move on to the next slide if I can here. So transitioning from full cars. Let me go back one. Sorry. So this is this is a, a next step in um, really a multi-year transition and phase in process for this program. And if, if we go back to to the beginning, uh, the original agreement with Shell was a full requirements contract. So 100 percent of all the energy services needed to, to run this program was procured through that agreement with Shell. Um, since then, that amendment, or that agreement has been amended several times. We've uh, amended it for the various phases that have already taken place. And we've also um, amended it as MEA has, has procured resources independent from Shell. So this is another step in that transition. The, um, the, the, as we'll get into, the, the proposed agreement structure really unbundles the different products and services that Shell is providing and will facilitate the continued, um, the continued development of MBA's independent procurement program. We'll go to the transaction overview. So the um, fundamental changes here are uh, for, for certain of the products for the, um, for the non-renewable energy and scheduling service, we're actually extending the delivery term that, so that it will go through 2017. But we are also uh, specifying scheduled reductions in the volumes that Shell will be providing during the term. Again, that's part of the transition strategy. It really, uh, the, the uh, MEA's independent procurement efforts has really been focused on renewable energy and that is actually a, a very um, mature process. You know, we have the open season process, we um, occasionally do a, an RFP. Uh, currently, the majority of MEA's renewable energy is procured, has, has been procured outside of Shell and we, um, with, under the new structure, over 80% of the renewable energy will be procured outside of Shell by the, by the end of the term, by, by 2016. So that's really been the focus. Um, what's next on the, uh, on the plate, really, is turning our attention to the non-renewable side. And this is going to take a little bit longer. Um, the the non-renewable non procurement, uh, there's a couple of really things that need to take place before NBA is going to be in a position to really manage that portfolio independently. One is just the um, continued passage of time, demonstration of the business model, accumulation of financial reserves, and an establishment of a credit rating. That will be key because power supply transactions, uh, it's a capital intensive business. One of the great values that Shell has been providing from the beginning is providing that capital on MBA's behalf. Um, so that transition process will take a little longer. What we're able to do through this agreement, through this amendment, is to give ourselves a little bit more time, a couple more years, in order to develop the systems and the credit rating so that we can take on the, the procurement of conventional energy. The, um, the agreement 
as I mentioned, accommodates the, the Richmond expansion. Uh, it allows MEA to take some additional energy at historically low prices, um, helping to provide competitive rates for customers for the next several years. <coughs> and all of the agreements, all of the confirmations that we're talking about, you know, we've scheduled in these volume reductions, but we also have provisions in the confirmations or in the agreements where MEA can substitute its own resources for power that, that would otherwise be provided by Shell. So this is what has been known as the resource substitution clause. We've had that from the beginning. Those provisions will continue to be in place. So before I talk um, in more detail about the, the new structure, the proposed structure, just remind you of the current structure. So the, um, the current agreement with Shell it's all, um, it's, well, there's an umbrella master agreement. It's called the EEI Master Power um, Purchase and Sale Agreement. And this is essentially spells out the standard terms and conditions. It's not transac transaction specific. It's relationship. It, it develops the relationship and the terms under which separate transactions, which are referred to as confirmations, um, that's, where, that's where products and services are actually bought and sold. So we have the master agreement, which was entered into in February of 2010. Uh, the current, we have currently have two confirmations. We have, you can think of it as an energy confirmation. Uh, technically, it's called the Second Amendment to and Restatement of Confirmation. And, and this provides, um, it's a, for purchase of specified volumes of non-renewable energy, renewable energy, and scheduling services through May 6 of 2015. So this is a bit of a bundled um, uh, uh, energy contract providing both the renewables and non-renewables and the scheduling. That's the current confirmation. We have a separate confirmation for resource adequacy capacity. Um, that was split out, unbundled, um, when we did in February of this year, when we uh, amended the agreements to, to deal with the Phase 2B expansion. And do you want to just do a quick primer again on what that is? The capacity sure so there's um, there's really three products that MEA needs to uh, obtain in order to supply customers so there is energy there is renewable energy or at least the renewable attribute um, and then there's capacity and so the capacity requirement what that means is rather than uh, when you're talking about energy you're talking about may what hours right you're talking about what you, sort of what you pay at the end of the month as a, as a customer capacity is how much actual physical generating capacity is in the ground. Um, so it's, it's measured in megawatts. Um, and so the requirement that MEA has, just like PG&E and just like uh, any other entity that's out there serving load, is that um, MEA needs to demonstrate in advance, a year in advance, that it has enough capacity under contract, plus a reserve margin, 15% reserve margin, to ensure reliability. So it's a, it's, it's a separate product, um, and uh, it's being provided by Shell for MEA through this confirmation for resource advocacy. That currently goes through uh, the end of 2015. Under the proposed structure, we still have the master agreement. There's nothing changing there. Um, what we will wind up with are now three confirmations. So we're, we're further unbundling. We'll have a, we'll have a what we're going to call a renewable energy confirmation, a non-renewable energy confirmation, and a resource adequacy or capacity confirmation. So the uh, the technical uh, name for the renewable energy confirmation is actually now the third amendment to in restatement of confirmation. So this will um, this sets forth the purchase of specified volumes of non-renewable energy and scheduling services. Uh, from January 1, 2013, so the start of next year, through, um, oh, I'm sorry, I said, uh, let, let, me, let, me, uh, let me start that over. It specifies the uh, purchase of non-renewable energy and scheduling services up to January uh, 1st of next year, and for the purchase of renewable energy through December 31, 2016. Okay, so it, it, in fact, it will become a renewable only confirmation in January of next year. Uh, during this bridge period between now, or when the contract is executed, in January, it will also be providing uh, the non-renewable non energy and the scheduling services. 
And John, before you get into the three uh, breakout contracts, um, do you want to just quick overview why the decision to break it out as opposed to do the one overarching? Sure. The, 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 one of the, the reasons for doing that is it, it really facilitates um, our MEA's ability to procure these, these um, products from, from other providers. Uh, so it's not just one bundle. If MEA wants to go out and procure, say, capacity from another provider, it can do that without disrupting a, a, a bigger deal. Another um, more sort of technical or regulatorily technical reason has to do with there are um, regulations in place that apply to contracts that are greater than five, or five years or, or greater in, in length or in, in term. And these, um, these are related to emissions per, uh, performance standards. And the sort of the essence of it is that if you have a contract that is five years or longer, it needs to identify specific resources that are going to be used to supply the energy. And um, there's a history there, but the, this, was, this was set out um, to, uh, to prevent folks from sort of skirting the coming AB32 regulations by entering into long-term contracts with dirty, dirty resources. So the agreement that um, uh, what we want to do is make sure that uh, our, our agreement for non-renewable energy is less than five years because that deal has always been uh, for system power, not for specific resources. So we want to make sure that that is, that is compliant with this emissions performance standard. The renewable agreement will be longer than five years, and that will actually specify the resources that will be used, so that will be compliant with the, with the EPS. Um, and so those are really the two reasons. One is sort of um, regulatory mandate, really regulatorily mandated, and the other is more of a, of a business reason that it makes good sense to have these products in separate agreements. So, um, okay, so anyway, the, uh, the, so the, the, the renewable energy confirmation will become renewable energy only as of next year, as of January next year. That's when the non-renewable confirmation will, will become effective as well. So then starting on January 2nd, all the non-renewable energy will be provided through that confirmation as well as scheduling coordination services. And that will go through the end of 2017. And then the, um, the RA confirmation, there's really no change there structurally. The only difference with the RA confirmation will be the additional volumes for the City of Richmond customers. So in terms of, you've got um, in the packet, you have the agreements in red line form. There have been some additional changes over uh, since the packet was, was, uh, was, was distributed to the agreements, and I would characterize the vast majority of the changes as cleanup type changes. Um, the, the changes that are actually of substance, I'll, I'll highlight as we go forward. And, and I think you have a clean before version. Before we leave this page, just to underscore, so there's three different end dates now. Capacity 2015, renewable 2016, and non-renewable 2017. That's correct. Three C. That's correct. So, and that's all, that's all part of the overarching strategy to essentially start weaning ourselves or continue the transition away from a, a, a single supplier model. You know, we, we now have, as I mentioned, eight renewable contracts. Uh, the plan is to um, continue that, to continue to expand the number of counterparties that MBA is dealing with and, and diversify the number of suppliers that MBA is dealing with. So in terms of now the, uh, the renewable confirmation or the, the third unit that we stated, so this agreement will provide a, a declining portion of MEA's renewable energy supply through 2016. So that's the uh, scheduled reduction in volume. We're really using Shell at this point on the renewables just to fill some holes that we have because we are uh, so well advanced on the independent pr procurement program. Uh, this agreement would include uh, bucket one and bucket two. For folks who are familiar with the, with the terminology, uh, renewable energy for RPS compliance purposes, there are really three types of um, contracting mechanisms that you can use. Bucket one is essentially in-state 
the resources that you're buying the energy and the renewable attribute from. Bucket two is essentially out-of-state resources that you're buying the renewable energy, uh, the energy and the renewable attribute from. Um, but there's some restrictions on how that's scheduled. And then bucket three are unbundled rec purchases. So you're, you're just buying the renewable attribute uh, from a renewable generator, but you're not necessarily worrying about scheduling the energy from wherever they're located to the load and going through the, the ISO protocol. So what we're talking about here are some additional bucket one and bucket two volumes. Uh, we've taken the opportunity in, in the, the, um, the amendment here to incorporate the CPUC standard terms and conditions that they want to see or they would really require um, to, to be present in all RPS qualifying renewable purchase contracts. Uh, something here that is different than what was in the board packet and that is really, a, I think, a, a positive development is that this confirmation will have an exhibit that identifies the specific resources that will, the specific mobile resources that will be providing power um, to, uh, to supply MEA. Uh, so, you know, in, in the past it's just been, we were really sort of told after the fact, these are the renewables that you got. Now we're actually seeing these uh, in advance, and I think that's a, a real positive for us. The, uh, as I mentioned, this this has this um, confirm sort of has a little bit of a bridge period to it, you know, from from execution to January, where it also includes the non-renewable energy and the scheduling services. Um, that that that'll that'll persist until the effective date of the second confirmation, which is January second. And then in terms of the energy pricing, um, energy prices are still at historical lows. So um, we expect that the pricing will be similar to the um, existing contract prices. Uh, on average, it looks like uh, it might be a little bit um, lower for the bucket one and a little bit higher for the bucket two compared to the current contract, but on net, it's, it's pretty, much, uh, pretty much a wash. Um, so in, let me just, in terms of the changes from, from what you saw in the, in the original board packet, this is the one that has the more uh, uh, significant change. As I mentioned, the, this Exhibit 3, which is new and will identify the, the renewable resources being used to supply us, um, or at least the portion being, being supplied by Shell. The, uh, there's a, this is referenced in Section 2.2C, and uh, what you'll see in that section is the language that we needed for compliance with the emissions portfolio standard that I, that I mentioned earlier. It also in, in 2.2, um, in 2.2a, we've clarified and simplified the language so that it's clear that the seller will provide the volumes that are specified in the exhibit. Um, and, and this is, is really, uh, you know, this is a, a, a simplification. It also recognizes that MEA is no longer relying on Shell to, to manage MEA's overall renewable portfolio, but MEA is doing that independently. We're just buying specified volumes from Shell through this confirmation. And then the changes to Section 2.2 also um, require some changes to Section 8.1 and 8.2. Um, and in, in essence, what sections, the, the new sections 8.1 and 8.2 uh, do are they allow uh, MEA to, to work with Shell to remarket any excess renewable energy that MEA has. That would be at MEA's discretion. MEA could, could <coughs> bank the excess. It could choose to uh, uh, work with Shell to remarket that. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a little bit of a, it's a slight change really from what was in the packet. And then similarly um, in 8.2, there's, there's a provision that MEA can re request Shell's assistance to procure additional renewable energy if, if MEA desires. So fairly, fairly minor, and really that was to conform to the change to Section 2.2. Any questions on, on, the, on that confirmation? I'm about to move on to the, the next one. Okay. So the, the second confirmation or the non-renewable energy confirmation. 
So this, uh, this confirmation will provide a declining portion of ener MEA's energy supply through 2017. Uh, the, the decline in the volumes, as I think I've indicated, are really timed um, to, uh, to synchronize with production from MEA's other resources. This agreement includes energy and scheduling coordination services. The delivery term begins January 2nd, so it's, a, it's less than five years in the term. And uh, the pricing is expected to be similar uh, to the current contract prices for the existing term. And then the final um, confirmation, the resource adequacy confirmation, what this will provide is uh, MEA system, there, back up just a second. So when we talk about capacity, resource advocacy capacity, there's actually um, a number of products that are, are necessary there. There are, There's capacity that can be anywhere on the grid, and then there's capacity that has to be specifically located in certain areas, <coughs> certain areas that are, are, have reliability concerns. They call these local reliability areas. So MEA buys system resource advocacy capacity, uh, resource advocacy capacity in the Bay Area, uh, which is the CAISO, California Independent System Operator Defined Reliability Area, and then um, uh, RA, or resource advocacy capacity, and the other pg e local reliability area. So what this confirmation will do, it will provide for the system RA requirements through 2014. Um, all of MBA system RA requirements through 2014, and then a portion of the system and local requirements through the end of 2015. Uh, the delivery terms unchanged for, for the RA confirmation is continues to be from May 10th of 2010 through the end of 2015. And in regards to the pricing, the current pricing is um, that's applicable to the incremental volumes. Again, these are the, the volumes necessary for the Richmond um, enrollments. Uh, we expect, uh, similar to current contract prices for the local RA products, and um, a little bit higher for the system RA products. And uh, that's, um, that's largely a result of uh, just what's happening in the market as um, there's concerns about the availability of San Onofre. You've heard, of, you've heard about that, that, that. That tends to, the fact that that unit is off, and may not come back, um, tends to increase the prices for capacity because that's a fairly large unit. There's some other um, market reasons why the price is a little bit higher for that. But uh, on balance, it, it's the uh, same for local and a little bit higher for, for RA. So what, what this does is it really leaves room um, because we're, we're just rolling, we're, uh, we're going to be supplying all of the, the needs through 2014 and some of the needs through 2015. This really leaves room for, in the shorter term, for MEA to start procuring RA capacity um, from other providers. Can you ask a question? Yep. On this resource capacity, what's our, if SEMA for whatever reason can't perform, do we have other providers? I realize that's perhaps <laughs> unrealistic since it's such a gigantic energy company, but yeah. for whatever reason that they can't perform, what happens? Well, it, it, I guess, so if they can't perform in this particular case, um, you know, they, uh, they provide us with information on the units that, we're, that they're selling to us for RA. So I, I guess non-performance in this case would be they fail to do that. Um, what would happen in that case is we'd go back to the master agreement and we, you know, they would be liable to us for damages. They essentially replace our replacement costs of going to another provider and, and buying that capacity. Cena would be liable to us for, the, for those costs. But that, thanks for answering that. I'm just I'm wondering about our customers when if the city doesn't perform and the energy has to be delivered, you're saying that we can find another provider, perhaps at a higher cost, and we'll see, see the, the difference, but there will be another provider that can fill in, is what you're saying. Yeah, there, there's, there's no chance that there would be uh, a customer interruption at all. Uh, the power flows through the CAISO, regardless of what happens. What this, this is a forward-looking compliance obligation. Um, so, what would, the practical effect, if, if we were unable, if the Shell was unable to provide our RA capacity, we would be deficient. When we file every month, we file our, a, a compliance filing with the, uh, the Energy Commission, the CAISO, and the CPUC, and we say, we've got this much peak demand, and we have this many resources. If we were un unable to do that, uh, MEA would be penalized. 
but there would be no um, there would be no disruption whatsoever to customers. Energy would still continue to flow. Appreciate that. Thank you. And then the next question is is regarding Cena, all the different types of energy mm -hmm. that you've been discussing in these different confirmations. Is the source of all of that within the CAISO? And it's not like out in Texas or Tennessee or someplace. I mean, it's it's in our grid system here. So I'm just curious where their where their energy is actually coming from. <coughs> right. So uh, capacity is all within the CAISO. Uh, the renewable energy is it's a mix of within California um, and uh, Pacific Northwest for the most part, Washington and Oregon. Uh, and then energy is it's unspecified, but it's it comes through the Kaiso. So it's really, you can really think of it as the Kaiso pool. Um, you know, I think you've heard the analogy before that, uh, that there's generators that are connected to the pool, and then there are customers in aggregate that are you know connect that take energy out of the pool, and you know you, you make sure that enough energy goes in to match what what you take out. But there's, you know you don't really you're not able to really track electrons in any. Um, Really? Yeah, I wasn't concerned about tracking the electrons. I was just curious. Well, it can't come from Texas. We're not connected to Texas. Yeah, okay. Right? I was just curious yeah. where Cena's sources of energy are. Yeah. So you've, you've answered it. It's California, Oregon, Washington, basically. Yeah. Thank you. The recommendation, uh, and as in the staff report, is to authorize the executive officer and the board chair um, to execute the three confirmation agreements. Third Amendment to a restatement confirmation, second confirmation, and the First Amendment to a restatement of confirmation for resource advocacy. With that I am delighted to answer any more questions. Any further questions from the board? <clears throat> and these are also discussed at our ad hoc contracts committee uh, meeting as well. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Uh, members of the public on these three proposed confirmations. Okay. Do you need separate motions or single motions? You read my mind. How do you want to? Two separate motions. Let's do separate. Okay. That's one confirmation, two. Move to approve for the First Amendment. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, yes. Opposed? That matter here. Will we approve the second uh, confirmation? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, yes. uh, Sorry, I'm going to have to channel Beth, but I think we need to be more specific. So the, the first recommendation was to prove that the, it wasn't just wasn't clear. Um, first Amendment and Restatement of Confirmation. <coughs> I think the, the first item is the Third Amendment to a Restatement of <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> So I don't know. Go back to the next slide. You want to <laughs> start with the reverse <laughs> or <laughs> start with the third? Withdraw your Which is the Move to approve the first amendment uh, uh, to the restatement of confirmation agreement. Second. All in favor. All in favor. Uh, yes. Opposed. Yeah. Move to approve second confirmation agreement. <laughs> second. You don't say All in favor. Uh, yeah. Opposed, that might occur. I'm not going any further. <laughs> <laughs> you want to leave it to yeah, someone else? Means. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Move to move to approve, approve proposed First Amendment to and restatement of confirmation for resource adequacy agreement. Second. <laughs> we'll give that to the director. I got it. I got one in. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Yeah. Opposed, that might occur. And thank you, John, for that very clear explanation. Yeah. Good job. By everyone. They don't call you technical consultant for nothing. <laughs> and again, overall picture, this ties into our integrated resource, yeah. right? Which, which is going to be one of our our governing documents, so to speak. Okay. Get my agenda here. Item nine, regulatory update. We're missing that. Oh no! Jeez. Uh, oh, so we have to chair. <laughs> so the actual presentation I'll be giving is going to be limited in scope to simply the energy efficiency programs and 
the regulatory process to securing the funding relating to that. Um, generally speaking of where we are in the regulatory world, we're in a little calm before the storm. If you look through the, the update summary, you'll see that there are a lot of pending proposed decisions, and as soon as those come through, then there's going to be a frenzy of work, but right now it's a lot of things we're waiting for the Commission to, to make a final action on. One of them is very dear to our hearts and our minds because it has to do with the 2013-2014 energy efficiency proposals. Uh, so I'll cover really three three different ways of, of looking at the energy efficiency proposals. The first is looking at the statute and the different ways that we can uh, secure funding for energy efficiency. The statute has Subsection or Section 381.1A, which was put in place by the original CCA Bill Assembly Bill 117, which allows CCAs to apply to administer funding. Um, the, we're, based upon the language, we're allowed to apply to administer funding for any ratepayer within our service territory, whether or not they are a member of a opted in member of our program. Uh, our clean energy program option 381.1 E and F are alternate uh, pathway to securing funding and this was put in place with Senate Bill 790 and in this case it's an election process where the, the CCA and its board decides that they want to elect to administer the funds that are being collected from their CCA customers to then apply for its energy efficiency program. So that should sound familiar because that's what we used for the 2012 energy efficiency funding. We elected, the commission's responsibility was simply to review and ultimately certify that our proposal was thoroughly thought through. Um, with the methodology A, instead it's a broader pool of funding, it's a broader pool of potential customers that could be served by it, and it's also a more detailed review process with the commission. It's more the jurisdiction on whether or not we are permitted to do this rests with the, the commission's ultimate say. Um, so that's what we're, those are the steps we're going through with the 13-14 cycle. Um, so because the, the funding is different and because the customer eligibility pool is different between E and EF and A, it really shapes the different ways that we uh, are able to use the funds. You can see with the 2012 proposal that we have already secured funding for and we're beginning to implement with Becky. Um, and it's limited in scope. It's just for the remainder of the 2012 cycle. It's primarily focused on multifamily. Um, it's really, as I said, it's limited to Marin Clean Energy customers only because that's where the funds are being collected from. Um, and that also clearly defines that they're within our jurisdiction and the jurisdiction of the board. With the 2013-14 cycle, we've decided to apply for funding through the methodology A rather than E and F. This expands the amount of funding that we're able to apply for. This also expands the scope to be able to offer programs to people within our service territory regardless of whether or not they choose to participate We're in clean energy. Um, so this is really a big step, and in this, in our proposal, we have multiple components: the single family, the small commercial, the multifamily, and a couple of finance models on bill repayment, which is particularly exciting because it requires a billing structure to implement. And because we, the FCCA, and we're working with PPD through billing, we're able to do that, whereas other third parties that may be looking to run finance programs are not able to. So the standard, standard offer, um, which is similar to feed and tariff, where we are essentially offering a standard price to procure megawatts rather than megawatts for energy savings. So we put out this price, uh, entities can approach us and say, we are willing to provide you this many megawatts of savings, of energy savings, if you will pay us a certain amount. And for the 2015 and beyond, that is largely up in the air. We have the choice to apply either under the A or under the E and F methodology. 
Um, there's also some discussion going on with the Commission and the general energy efficiency proceeding about what the more um, standard long-term rules should be and the process should be for reviewing either these, the election or the application process. Uh, in that case, that is one of those items where we're waiting on further guidance from the Commission to have that, that uh, discussion should continue. Uh, and we actually, one thing that isn't on here, but we're looking at for the potentially the 13, 14 cycle and the 15 and beyond cycles as well, is that there are a number of, uh, there are a couple of programs for low income groups, and one of them is the um, Energy Savings Assistance Program, which is collected through public purpose charges, non bypassable charges and potentially could be accessed through the EF methodology the same way that we access some general funds for energy efficiency. Uh, so that could be a parallel application and parallel program with separate funding stream for energy efficiency, but reserve earmarked specifically for low income customers. Uh, so that may be a, a next step. There, the commission just resolve their cycle of deciding how they're going to implement the next cycle of that period. So, um, it's a little odd that it's out of sync with the general energy efficiency cycle. Uh, but there is room, but we believe there is room to secure funding because the funds are being collected from our customers. Uh, and going to the next one, this is the uh, timeline portrayal. It shows a little bit better of where we are with each of the three we are now in implementation phase of the 2012 Energy Efficiency Program, which is very exciting. And that will continue on through the end of 2012 and spill over a little bit into 2013 um, and will ultimately be wrapped up. The 2013-14 cycle is in the last few steps of the formal review process by the Commission. We are anticipating a proposed decision from the Commission actually next Tuesday on the 9th. Based upon that language, they will then have a, we will have a brief period to comment upon that and provide reply comments to what other parties may say. And in November, November 8th, it should reach the commission for a vote. So it will come upon us pretty quickly. Then based upon that decision, there will be the potential for workshops and follow through the, the implementation. Uh, one thing that's important to mention, and I believe some of you are aware of this already, is with the 13-14 cycle, the Commission is looking at uh, providing energy efficiency program administration to uh, a new construct, something called uh, regional energy networks, which are uh, basically lo local government entities that come together and want to administer energy efficiency funding programs within their territory. Um, this is something that the Commission has put together as an, a new model, rather than having the investor-owned utilities be the direct administrators, they're letting the local governments take a more authoritative role in this society. Um, but there is a little bit of confusion in the process about what the differences are between brands and what a CCA is able to do. And a key distinction is that CCA has legislative backing and, and statutory language allowing us to administer the programs. So we're working through doing a little hand-holding with the commission making sure that they don't confuse us with the other entities as well and we believe that the, this uh, decision will be quite interesting because it will be a diversification of energy efficiency program administration in a way that hasn't been seen in california so the commission is actually looking to be quite innovative and experimental in this next phase which is exciting it's good for us and yeah that's Pretty much it. Okay. Hopefully, that helps clarify the process a little. Questions for Jeremy? Right. Yeah. Good. 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 Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the regional energy networks. Mm -hmm. Could you? Ex yeah. Um, explain a little bit more about how that would work. So there are the commission open up the process for local governments to put together a proposal to administer energy efficiency funds. Uh, 
there were a couple groups of local governments that decided to try to pull together and go through the, the application process. It's quite a chorus. Um, the Association of Bay Area Governments was one of those entities, and they're really the, like the only run in the Northern California area that's looking to develop and administer funds. Uh, I believe there are a couple in the Southern California region that are looking to administer funds. Um, we've actually been working and been in close communication with ABAC through the process to make sure that the types of programs that we're proposing uh, are distinctly different and do not overlap with what they ran as they, they're calling themselves the San Francisco Bay Area Regional Energy Network. Uh, making sure that what we're attempting to do and what they're attempting to do don't overlap. And really by, the commission really wants this to be an experimental phase because they've been very unhappy and underwhelmed with what the investor and utilities have been able to accomplish. And so the thought that we've had and the thought that the RENs have had as well is that if we can diversify the different types of programs and the different types of pilots, as much as possible, then we can really see what works and what doesn't and bring it back to the commission so that they can, say, start mandating certain types of energy efficiency programs in the 15, 2015 and beyond cycle. Uh, so the Bay Ren is the, the other Ren within the Bay Area that could be providing these services. They're actually one item that we decided to uh, concede to them was a PACE program for uh, funding of energy efficiency programs. And the, there is potential for some, because our programs are each subcomponent distinctly different, there's some potential for our customers to dabble a little bit into the programs, opt into the, some of the offerings that Bayron has rather than some of the offerings that we have. But the commission's also very um, careful about making allowing that sort of cross-pollination to occur and then allowing the different entities to claim the energy savings that they've created. So that we're not claiming to uh, have saved a certain amount of energy that they rent also have and save and so forth. And that the Commission's actually been very concerned about overlap with the investor and utility program <coughs> programs as well. So. Yes, sir. Uh, Don, I was curious, can you give us a quick update on where we are with multifamily and, and the energy efficiency and how, how we're doing and whatever help we can do? Yeah, I, on that? I have to say since we um, brought on our new team member, Becky Menton, um, the program has just taken off um, very quickly. We had a, a very large planning meeting today that, that lasted for four and a half hours. At least the agenda looked pretty heavy. Um, with a lot of participants um, from different um, sectors, including vendors that are going to be providing services through the program, um, and representatives from uh, the community in both Richmond and uh, in Marin County. Um, and and uh, it was a very productive meeting. Um, a lot has happened in addition to that. We've been um, identifying which vendors would be the best fit for the multifamily program so that we can focus on that program really first. Um, we've entered into initial contracts with three vendors to date. Um, and we're going. We're looking at a couple of others that might be providing some related services, but probably starting for the 2013 program. We also have developed a, a comprehensive list of properties. Uh, it, it, actually, it's a it's a start of a of a list, it's, but it looks very comprehensive already. It has um, you know, more than a hundred properties shown there. Um, where we'll be reaching out, and we what we've found in pinning down really, we're, we're going to be looking to achieve. Um, the greatest cost effectiveness, of course, that we can given the budget that is coming in, um, which is a little less than we had hoped for, and um, it's going to be um, it's going to be challenging to achieve the results with the, the limited budget that we have. Um, however, we're going we're looking at opportunities to leverage um, other funds that are out there, particularly federal funds for low income multifamily housing that might be able to help us to um, uh, leverage uh, those resources to achieve uh, additional results. And so we're particularly interested in, uh, in low-income multifamily community uh, uh, buildings initially, um, and but other multifamily units that we come across would be a good fit for the program that we'll be launching in 2013. So we'll be talking to uh, those property owners even uh, towards the end of this year. So the, 
those are some things that happened in the early development of the program. We have actually already had a meeting uh, at one of the buildings in Wayne City that looks like a good candidate, and the, one of the three contractors that we brought on is going to be playing the role of doing many of the audits and retrofits. And they've been working with us to define the list of incentives that we'll be offering. Incentives really are direct dollars for certain things that, that are installed. And they are starting to help us pin down which things we should offer incentives for and at what levels in order to incentivize um, the, the, the broadest retrofits that, that we'll be able to achieve. Yes. The only thing that, I, if I heard you correctly, the only thing I'd be concerned about is if the companies that are doing the audits are also the companies that are doing the work. Sometimes there's a little conflict there. If you, if you understand, and you're, you're identifying that, yeah, we see you need all this work and we're going to do the work. Mm -hmm. Do you see any issue or concern there? Well, really, and I'll, Becky, if you want to weigh in, feel free to come up uh, to the podium. But what I'll say is we, we've actually found that having one vendor doing kind of the soup to nuts, particularly for a, a large complex building where we're going to be touching a lot of common areas, possibly the parking lot, possibly getting into some of the tenant units, it really helps for them to be on the hook for the savings. Because what we're trying to achieve is not just a, a pretty retrofit that looks nice at the end of the day and is under budget, but what we're looking for is, is savings, is specific kilowatt hour savings. And those are measured uh, and have to be um, proven. And so the, the, if they're on the hook from start to finish, then um, we think that is more effective than having a, uh, a two vendor model where uh, you know, folks can go like this and you don't have one entity that's really on the hook for delivering the savings. But do you wanna to add to that, Becky? Sure, um, thanks for giving me an opportunity to jump in here. Um, the one thing I would add is that because we're leveraging some of the low income programs or hoping to, um, some of those come along with some pretty specific requirements about how the business is run. Um, we're looking to work in particular with the Low Income Housing Energy Assistance Program, known as the LIHEAP program. It's a program that's run through federally funded sources. And they actually have a requirement that the auditor, um, they have specific auditing requirements and it's the contractor who provides those audits and also delivers the services um, to the extent that they're capable of doing that. Um, with the common area measures, however, we have a partner on board the Association for Energy Affordability. It's a nonprofit organization out of um, the East Coast who's really developed a West Coast presence in the last three or four years. And their specialty is really in developing auditing requirements and in providing quality assurance and technical oversight for the project. So they won't actually be performing the work on most of the common area facilities, but they'll be serving as a single point of contact and a coordinator for the program overseeing some of the work of the other contractors and providing some back-end quality assurance on the whole package. So we feel very comfortable and confident with them on board. They essentially have wrote the book for how to how to run this program for the multifamily sector. Thank you. Right. Any further questions or comments? Members of the public on the regulatory board? Mm -hmm. And I imagine we'll be hearing a lot more just kind of regular updates at this point on that energy efficiency <coughs> yeah. efforts. Yeah. Uh, very much appreciated. Barbara. Um, yeah, the energy efficiency programs. So this is it's very, very complex and very busy right now. And uh, uh, there's an additional proceeding called the RIM, the Risk Reward Incentive Mechanism. And this is the shareholders' incentives for energy, you know, to reward utilities for their lousy energy efficiency programs. And um, this proceeding has been going on and on and on for like three years. And uh, they did take comments that early on before, you know, parties that recommended just forget it. Um, but then just recently they they cranked it up and said, you know, they wanted uh, kind of on a fast track to determine what sorts of new proposals are out there for, for risk rewards and, and, you know, going into great deal of specifics. So I have sat that one out because they actually, the judge said literally, don't comment if you don't want shareholders incentives. And so that is moving forward. I frankly think this is an issue that 
needs to go to the governor. <coughs> it's coming from the governor. I don't think that the commission, um, I know some of the commissioners are pretty disgusted with it. I uh, think the judge is really disgusted with it. And, uh, and I really do, unfortunately, think that it's the governor's call at this point. I think he's trying to make, make nice to utilities for various reasons. Um, so I recommend um, complaining about that because it's really, it's one of the things that is going to drive a wedge between us and the, and the regional energy networks. Um, the regional energy networks offered to give utilities credit for all of the savings that are being done by local governments with independent, you know, independently of the utilities. Um, <coughs> and so, uh, since they just, you know, said, here, take us, um, uh, that really is an unfortunate um, aspect of the regional energy networks that they, you know, they were not willing to, to fight for the credit going to the local governments. Because that means that, for example, that the local governments would not get any greenhouse gas credits. And it also means, of course, that the utilities are going to get, you know, outrageous amounts of money. Um, the last time, the last cycle, <coughs> the three-year cycle, it ended in 20, um, 2009, they, they got $240 million the, for, for utilities for programs that failed all their targets, only got 62% of their targets, and they were supposed to start getting penalties if they were below 85%. They were supposed to get nothing or penalties. And the judge said, well, we're not going to give them penalties, but we, they shouldn't, you know, they should get nothing. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, Michael Peavy turned it around and uh, ran it through. So that's uh, that's a big difference between us and them. On the other hand, I think that's one of the reasons why we're only getting 15% of our funds. And I really, I have no idea what's going to be in Julie Fitch's decision, but um, we, you know, we'll find out pretty soon. Um, but I hope that the board will authorize some, you know, some um, effort to to recapture the funds that we've lost in this process. Uh, and I I know we wanted to get our programs going, and so now we have them going. But I think it's you know we really need to go back and say, hey, 15 percent is not. Um, I think I explained this last time that the regional energy networks, you would think that would be the regional program, but it isn't. The regional energy efficiency has never been defined by the commission um, until the June 20th ruling by ALJ Fitch, which said that the regional you know, the, the, these are the AB117, there's a line that says that the, you know, we need to accommodate statewide and regional programs, uh, accommodate the need for statewide and regional programs. And I said, well, you could accommodate the need by, you know, we could, you know, we could do a generic residential program. I mean, the utilities are all doing separate programs in their own territories. They're not exactly the same. And then the public utilities are doing something else in their territories and so we you know we could contract with a public utility like SMUD to do a really terrific residential program um, much better than anything that the utilities have done. So anyway um, the, the Fitch ruling in, in June and they carried this through so far this is what stands this summer is that the um, regional programs are defined as anything a utility does in its whole territory as opposed to what it does locally um, and what's not statewide. Statewide, even though it's just the utilities, it's not the, it's not the whole state, um, it's, you know, it's just the 75% that's invested around utilities. So statewide programs are 60% um, of the programs, these lousy programs, and the regional programs are you know, 15% and what's left is the programs, 15%, that's what we got. 
So Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, as we mentioned, we appreciate your ongoing input on these issues. We, we will be making this a regular feature, I think, of our meetings um, as we go forward with our energy efficiency efforts. Any further uh, comments or questions on that item, the regulatory update? It was, a great, it was a good update, thank you. Yeah, great. thanks again, Jeremy. Tough shoes to go. <laughs> Very tough shoes. Yeah. Okay, item 10, board member and staff matters. Seeing none, or adjourn. Excuse me, can I just make yes. coffee for you, Jeremy? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 All right. All right. I just, because when, when we um, passed um, the um, motion in Richmond to um, agree to join all of you um, in this wonderful endeavor, um, there was kind of a, a second piece of it, and I don't know if Dawn had a chance to explain it to them. But um, I, and what, and the, the part of it was that, that the representative, which um, has been a, um, uh, approved by the council being vice mayor, I'm sorry, he's uh, not vice mayor anymore, um, council member Tom Butt um, would advocate, and because he's not there, I'm the alternate, so I'm taking on this role for today, of, um, to advocate or at least present this for now, uh, this proposal, and I'm just going to, it's just a short you know, sentence or two, it would have to be worked out. Um, but because we're aware of these exit fees that PG&E requires, the PCIA, um, and because we have a large number um, of care customers in Richmond, uh, I don't recall how many we have, but it's significant. Um, and there was some concern, I mean, I think understandably uh, among all of us on the council that, that um, you know, this additional amount would, would have to be paid by the, um, yeah by customers in general, but especially for the low-income community that are care customers. So the um, suggestion was that um, because Richmond will be bringing in more revenue, that out of that additional revenue that Richmond brings to MEA as a whole, that um, we as a board um, consider subsidizing care this uh, exit fee for care customers. And I would say beyond Richmond, I mean, I know there's less of a percentage of care customers in other cities, I mean, they're, you know, that are on this board, but, you know, it could be extended to all care customers in, in all cities. So that would be, that's just a suggestion, a, a seed I'm wanting to plant. So, um, you know, as we go forward. Great, thank you for mm -hmm. that input. Okay, any further? <laughs> 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 <We're in there. laughs>